On the last Sunday of every month, a group that calls itself the MRR meets here in Miami to discuss government conflicts regarding Cuba. These politicians, historians, and veterans can remember a time where life was at the mercy of the clashing superpowers. Never was the world closer to World War III than during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Thank you and good night. What the psychological crisis? Certainly the most dangerous episode in human history. In Cuba, in the United States, we were in war. It all began in 1959 when Fidel Castro's men captured Havana. At this point, the Soviet Union had no diplomatic relations with the new regime. But shortly after Castro's victory, a delegation was sent. On May 17th of 1959, Cuba passed the Agrarian Reform Law that allowed the government to seize farms of any size. This law sent an exodus of upper and middle class Cubans to Miami and nationalized all American holdings. Still intact as of 2013, Eisenhower placed Cuba under a trade embargo that cut off their main supply of power and oil. Cuba was obliged to seek help from its new ally. Soviet tankers loaded with petroleum products promptly met the island's request. Although Cuba had been a capitalist nation under Batista, Castro began enlisting communists into his government. Unsatisfied with the result of the revolution, President Eisenhower and the CIA began planning an attack on the Bay of Pigs. After gathering the anti-Castro segments of Cuban Americans living in Florida, Howard Hunt, one of the key agents involved, moved the newborn militia to be trained in Mexico. The objective of the plan was to bring about the replacement of the Castro regime with one more devoted to the true interests of the Cuban people and more acceptable to the U.S. in such a manner to avoid any appearance of U.S. intervention. In May of 1960, during his campaign, John F. Kennedy had secretly approved the invasion plans. After taking office, the Bay of Pigs invasion was unsuccessfully carried out. As most of the surviving Cuban exiles were sent back to the U.S., Kennedy publicly denied having any participation. Against the Cuban dictator, while we could not be expected to hide our sympathies, we made it repeatedly clear that the armed forces of this country would not intervene in any way. After the fiasco, Cuba officially joined the Soviet bloc and the Soviet Union intensified their military aid to Cuba. In October of 1962, the first of 150 Soviet ships loaded with heavily disguised missiles sailed for Cuba. We gave them as many arms as the Cuban army could absorb. It would be a strategic advantage for Russia to yeah. establish, uh, establish mm -hmm. a missile base in uh, 90 million of the Soviet Each great power has their obligation to protect all their allies, their far close, they're important or they're not important. And when Castro, after the Bay of Pigs, declared officially that he joined the Soviet bloc, he put this obligation on the, my father's shoulders. And through this, the Cuba became to the Soviet Union the same as the West Berlin to the United States. Useless small piece of land, very deep inside hostile territory. But if you will not protect this small piece of land, you will lose your face. Kennedy then deauthorized Operation Mongoose, a secret program of terrorism that had been set up to take down the communist leaders in Cuba. However, during the height of the crisis, Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, recalled the six sabotage teams that had already embarked on their missions. My intervention in this was directed Bill Harvey que era el, el executive action de las operaciones aquí contra Cuba, él infiltró dos kines. Yo fui para Cuba con ellos. No obstante, Kennedy había dado órdenes de que no hicieran ninguna intervención. On August 29th of 1962, U.S. spy planes provided the aerial photographs that for the first time revealed the offensive missiles in Cuba. This is a result of the photography taken Sunday, sir. How do you know this is a medium-range ballistic missile? The land, sir. 
When the United States confronted the Soviet Union about these missile bases, Khrushchev assured Kennedy, both publicly and privately, that they had only been deploying defensive arms. After establishing that action must be taken, Kennedy formed EXCOM, the executive committee of the National Security Council. These 15 men met continuously for the next 12 days, debating on whether to perform an airstrike on the missile bases or to organize a blockade. Knowing that an airstrike would result in nuclear war, on October 22, 1962, President Kennedy went on national television to inform the world of the plans to quarantine Cuba. According to these plans, the quarantine was to remain effective until the Soviet Union agreed to remove all offensive weapons from Cuba. Unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation to halt this offensive buildup. A strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound to Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. I have directed the armed forces to prepare for any eventuality. The following day, Kennedy received a letter from Khrushchev asserting that the blockade will not be acknowledged by Russian ships. The next morning, Wednesday, October 24th, the quarantine went into effect. Far Russian ships could be detected heading directly towards Cuba with no sign of stopping. Shortly after 10 o'clock, it was announced that two Russian ships were within a few miles from the quarantine barrier. But then came the disturbing Navy report that a Russian submarine had moved into position between the two ships. The minutes in the White House passed slowly as President Kennedy and his brother Robert awaited the final course of events. Finally, at 10.32, a messenger brought in a report. Six ships previously on their way to Cuba at the edge of the quarantine line have stopped or have turned back toward the Soviet Union. The quarantine ran effectively without military conflict until the Russians agreed not to send missiles to Cuba. Despite this major victory, the danger was anything but over. At a meeting of the United Nations, the American ambassador confronted the ambassador of the Soviet Union and presented furnished photograph arrangements of the missile bases in Cuba. This televised revelation was covered by many newspapers around the world that now looked at Khrushchev for a reaction. On October 26, two days after the initiating of the blockade, Khrushchev sent a confidential letter to the president. In the letter, Khrushchev agreed to remove the missiles and bombers on the condition that Kennedy assure that there would be no invasion of Cuba by the United States or anyone else. Khrushchev also required that the missiles in Turkey be removed as a reciprocal act. Kennedy agreed on the condition that the UN would be permitted to inspect the complete removal of the missiles and also that the missile withdrawal in Turkey be kept confidential. I want to make one thing absolutely clear. When we put our ballistic missiles in Cuba, we had no desire to start a war. On the contrary, our principal aim was only to deter America from starting a war. For a moment, the world had stood still, and now it was going round again. Although the superpowers initially clashed, by sacrificing pride in exchange for peace, two great leaders showed the world the priorities of humanity. Hopefully the retelling of this crisis will be an example to future generations, for those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. So can we see the worst nuclear standoff since the Cuban Missile Crisis between the Soviet Union and the U.S.?